my bad. Okay, good. Um, so that, that was just a reminder. Yeah, uh, the while group acts on the root system. And in particular, if we were to decompose the dual of the carton minus all of the hyperplanes orthogonal to the roots into um, open connected components, we can show that the while group acts simply and transitively on these um, so-called weight chambers. One thing that I said yesterday that wasn't quite right is that the regular weight uh, I said lived in one weight chamber. That's not quite true, but they actually live in the interior of some weight chamber. Their definition means that they don't lie in any of the hyperplanes um, that we remove uh, in, in defining the weight chambers. Um, so that's that sort of recap on yesterday. Um, today we'll start by sort of giving a second viewpoint on the while group, which we'll, we'll be using as well in, in what follows. Um, from there, we'll introduce the Bruhat decomposition, first on the algebraic group G, which is gonna be fixed throughout, and then on the associated flag variety, uh, G mod B, which we'll be denoting by this sort of matcal B. Um, so that decomposition is gonna motivate um, a geometric study um, on the flag variety using this Bruhat decomposition of so-called constructible sheaves on the flag variety. Um, and the idea is in order to get to the world of perverse sheaves in this context where we use the flag variety as a sort of toy model for the affine Grassmannian that we'll be working with later is we need to start with constructible sheaves, go derive by passing to the derived category of complexes of constructible sheaves, and then we'll be able to define the perverse, um, the category of perverse sheaves as an abelian category that's, that we'll see is the heart of a cheese structure on these derived categories. All of these words are sort of why we're here today for, for the most part, and I'll try to make that more digestible or intuitive. And lastly, we'll uh, give a definition of the convolution product, uh, once again at the level of the flag variety, and then later Alberto will be using the completely analog construction that gives uh, a convolution product on the Satake category, um, which is the category of perverse sheaves on the affine Grassmannian, where B is replaced by um, G taking values in O, the ring of formal power series. So that's the plan for today. Um, so let's start by introducing the second definition of the Weil group. This time, this is something that might be more familiar for people coming from like a Lie group differential geometry background, and this checks level at the, at, the, at the level of G. We just take the normalizer of our maximal torus, and we quotient that out by the torus itself. Um, by construction, if, if you use, um, if you just choose representative, representatives for every coset, you can get a map where every element of the while group is sent to a representative, which we'll denote by W dot. And because we define the while group, um, as only containing elements of the normalizer of T, this allows us to just conjugate T and as a result conjugate both weights and co-weights on T. Um, the first action we can define is on the, the weight lattice, which remember we denoted by X upper star T, by precomposition, meaning that if I give you a weight alpha as above, I can act on it by an element of W um, by sending T to alpha of W inverse T W. So the the convention is that you conjugate uh, starting with W inverse. Likewise, if I have a co-weight, this time it's kind of a one parameter subgroup of T, I can as act by post-composition. And if I, so that if I have a lambda here acting by W, another, an element of GM can be defined as sort of exter exterior conjugation. Um, so these are actions we get for free from this perspective on the Y group, and we'll be using them sort of in what, in what follows. And here, rem remember that this was denoted x lower star g. And one fact that's analogous to the Lie algebra setting is if you restrict this action to um, the roots as a subspace of the weight lattice, you, you, get, um, you, you get valid permutations. This action preserves roots and also reserves codes. Um, so that's our second viewpoint on the while group. Now we have some additional structure, sort of combinatorial structure on the while group. So the first one is um, a length function on W, and this time we wanna think of W as generated by these simple reflections. And under this perspective, um, given an element of the Y group W, we can ask for the minimal natural number such that it's possible to express W as a so-called reduced expression, meaning I can express it as a product of simple reflections. 
Um, so we call that a reduced expression. So this turns out to be a well-defined length function on the Weil group that satisfies, for instance, in the simplest cases, that the unit has length zero and each simple reflection has length one. The second combinatorial structure, which we'll be working with today, is the Bruhat order on the Weil group, and a terminology that we'll justify in a moment. And this is, a, this is gonna be a partial order on the Weil group where we declare an element W to be less than eta. If we can express um, essentially eta as an expansion of W. And this is best given sort of in terms of an example, so that the idea is I have reduced forms for W and eta such that, um, for instance, I'm just gonna write it as an example. If W is S1, S3, S5, I can basically re reach eta by just inserting new simple reflections, not necessarily in a single block. So I could reach eta by putting an S2 here, maybe an S4 here, S3, S5. So the idea is you just kind of add simple reflections anywhere in the, in the expansion. Now there are, vari there are variants of the Bruhat order called, the, called weak Bruhat orders, where we only allow for simple reflections to be inserted either on the right or the left. It's my impression that the one we'll be using today is this one called the strong Bruhat order, but if somebody thinks that's not the case, please interject. Um, I'm going off of that, that assumption. All right, so that's as much structural as we'll be giving on W. And from there, we're ready to, to, the, to introduce the Bruhat decomposition. So that's gonna be a decomposition of G um, defined as follows. If you... Sorry, that was yeah. like slightly too fast to me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you like le Let just me leave maybe it just, Is that okay? Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. So... The Bruhat decomposition um, is going to be a decomposition of G into double cosets, um, where we act by the Borel on both the right and the left on these representatives of the, the Weil group that we defined earlier. Um, and so the, the theorem is that if you look at this finite number of cosets, each of which um, is going to turn out to be a locally closed um, subset of, of um, G, you get a decomposition, a sort of a, a decomposition into disjoint components, um, as indicated sort of here. Um, what we're most interested in is um, if we take the quotient by the, the right action by B and move down to the flag variety, so B, this um, sort of curly B that we'll be using throughout, we get an associated decomposition into these um, so called um, Schubert cells curly B sub W, one for each element of the Weil group. So these guys would just be just the, the sort of image in the quotient of the cells upstairs. Um, I think it was Charlie who asked, is it okay if I move a little down or do you need a minute? So can you say again what you meant by expansion? Just... Oh yeah, I meant um, you have the two elements in reduced form and you can reach the greater one by inserting new simple reflections. Not necessarily in a consecutive fashion. Okay. Can you not always do that? Um, well, you can't reach S2 from S1, S3. Um, I guess, I guess you can't, I, I guess you're, you're probably not allowed to um, square things, if that's what you're asking, because that would that would not make sense. You could always get back to one and then back up. So I feel like, yeah, uh, you want them to be in reduced form. Um, okay, I see. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So yeah, this is sort of just rewriting what I just wrote. Um, okay, so this is kind of the decomposition that matters for us. Right. Okay, um, and I, th I thought I'd take just a minute to introduce the flag variety for people who may not have thought about it much before because it's 
sort of a fundamental object in its own right, and it's worth spending spending just a little moment talking about why it's called that way and what it does. Um, so one way of thinking about the flat variety for a given reductive group G is that it's a sort of a parameter space for the set of all possible choices of Borel inside G. Um, and the way one can arrive to this interpretation is you can act by conjugation on this space of Borel's because Borel's go to one another under conjugation. And then if you fix a given Borel B, the stabilizer under this action of B is gonna be B itself, so that you can pass through the quotient and get an induced map from G mod B, mod B into the Borel subgroups, where you take a coset and you just send it to the conjugate of B corresponding to it. And it turns out that this map is actually gonna give you a bijection and identifies the flag variety with the set of Borel's in G. The reason this is called um, a flag variety is because if you were to just take G to be GLN, in which case your Borel is, the standard Borel is taken to be upper triangular matrices, then um, it turns out that the collection of possible Borels is in one-to-one -one correspondence with, co with complete flags in C to the N, where this Borel is identified with the sort of standard flag where I just take the standard basis and I add one basis element at a time. Um, I guess I should zoom in a little bit. Um, and so if I fix this Borel, and I, I, I can sort of identify G mod B, GLN mod upper triangular matrices with the set of possible flags in CN. Um, what is like, there are two, I mean, there's one useful structure on G mod B, which is you can always show it's a complex projective variety. Remember that all of our algebraic groups are defined over C, as far as we're concerned. And another fact is more of a, the borel weil theorem um, is sort of one of the earliest, I think, uh, results of geometric rep theory proved in 1953, which connects unitary reducible representations of a compact complex Lie group with holomorphic line bundles over the flag variety. Um, and in the particular case, I guess, worth mentioning of um, G being SL2, the flag variety is gonna be P1. And so this relates representations of SL2, irreducible ones, with um, holomorphic line bundles on on P1, uh, which are classified by the Serre twisting sheaves, so with Z. And so this recovers the usual classification of irreducible representations of SL2 um, over the complex numbers with the integers. Um, yeah, hey, hey, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, like, what can I say? I don't, so without weight theory, it's not about unitary representations. So if you think about complex, complex mm -hmm. like groups, they're all affine. They're, they're just not, they're huge. They're just not compact at all. Oh, okay. So they okay. relate to just irreducible, finally made, it's, you know, irreducible representations of G, okay. where G is a complex algebraic group. Yeah. Yeah, my bad. I was, yeah, I wasn't quite sure. I, I took that off the end lab to be fair. And I, I felt <laughs> like there was something, something weird. Yeah. Happened. Thanks for, thanks for rectifying. So finite dimensional irreducible representations of G. Yeah. And those are the ones we know to be classified by symmetric polynomials and such. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and you also have to be, to be careful about, um, what am I trying to say? Not, not all homomorphic bundles give you a uh, irreducible representation. So for example, in the SO2 case, they, you know, like line bundles on P1 labeled by, um, they were about integer, but only the non like non-negative ones give you irreducible representation when you take global sections. So those correspond to the domino weights. So a subset of those yeah. give right. you. Yeah, my, my bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not very clear on on this theorem. So please don't quote me on this. Um, what I what I wanted to write really was geometry of the flag variety has to do with the representation theory of P. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. I'm so, no, it's, it's good. Thanks. Um, I should have mentioned that I wasn't too clear on this theorem. That's fair. I mean, all, all Leon is saying is in rep SL2, you just have to erase the arrowhead pointing up. It's just an injection. It's not a... Oh, it's an injection. Yeah. 
and that's then you then you're totally legit it, as long at least in an algebra geometric context yeah okay yeah thanks thanks Damian. all right um so that was is, uh, easy to describe that that function uh like what is the construction from an sl2 rep well, uh, you get the representation, I think the other way around, you get the representation as just taking global sections and naturally getting a G action because G acts on the flag variety. So that direction is, is straightforward to describe. Um, the other direction, I'm not quite sure, but maybe somebody else can jump in. I'll type in the chat. It would take us like slightly far afield. Yeah. Yeah, this is really just an interlude for because after all, like this is a learning mini course and I just thought the flag variety was worth spending a minute on. Which, which direction are we trying to go in? Um, I said the one I'm not clear about is going, um, going down. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can continue that sort of discussion in the chat and we can keep going. Sounds good. Sounds good. Good. So let's come back to the Bruhat decomposition of the flag variety. Um, okay, and that's a part where I, where I wanted to write a lot, I guess. Okay, so we can actually identify each stratum uh, B sub W for a given element of the Y group W with an affine space of dimension explicitly given by the length of the element of the Y group corresponding to that stratum. So this is an affine space of dimension equal to the length of W. So this gives us a lot of nice structure on each stratum. In particular, these are smooth. They're simply connected, and that's going to be useful in what follows. And they're locally closed, as are all strata, strata of, of a decomposition under the action of, a, of an algebraic group on a variety, pretty much. Uh, furthermore, um, we have a nice containment relation in terms of if I take the closure of one strata, of one stratum, sort of what do I get? Turns out I get precisely the union of other strata and the ones contained in there are gonna be like sort of indicated to us by the Bruhat order. So we get that two elements in the Y group are related by the Bruhat order if and only if the stratum associated to W is contained in the closure of the stratum associated to Eta. Um, and as a sort of, as the easiest such example, let's check G to be SL2. The by group is just Z mod 2. And as we said before, B here is just going to be P1. The stratum associated to the identity element is just going to be a point. The stratum associated to the only non-trivial simple reflection is going to be an affine line. So one being the dimension of the, one being the length of a simple, a simple reflection. Um, and then the containment relation says that since E is less than S, I can just add S, I get that the point is contained in the closure of the affine line. And so I get, this is the usual decomposition of P1 as an affine line together with a point as infinity, ad infinity. Um, one feature of this example, which generalizes well, is whenever I have a simple reflection, so an element with length one, the associated stratum is going to be an affine line with closure equal to, uh, with closure isomorphic to P1. In particular, the closure is going to be smooth. It is not always true that the closure of a stratum is smooth. Um, cool. So that's as much as I'll be saying about the Bruhat decomposition of the flag variety, and then we'll move on to, to using it. Um, later, Alberto will we'll be working with the flag variety, and I think he'll spend quite a bit of time explaining how the analog of the Bruhat decomposition in the, set, in the setting of the affine Grassmannian works out. Um, in this case, it will turn out that the indexing set um, will be given by dominant co-weights of G. So 
these are guys we usually denote by x lower star t plus. And this is, this is good from what we've seen yesterday. In particular, if we use the classification theorem, we have that um, simple objects in rep G jewel correspond to dominant weights in the dual torus, which correspond under the combinatorial definition of the Langlands Jewel group to dominant co weights of G. And these, in turn, by this Bruha type decomposition, um, are going to index the, stri the strata of um, the Bruha type decomposition. Of the Gross the affine Grossmannian, and then one last step will be studying the simple objects of the Satake category and figuring out that in fact this this is also the same as simple objects in the Satake category associated to G. So this is sort of the first time where we see that at least at the level of simple objects, the category of representations of the Langlands dual group and the Satake category of Equivariant for sheaves on the affine Grassmannian have simple objects indexed by the same sort of structure. And this is the first indication that the geometric static equivalence sort of stands a chance, or this is something you might conjecture. Okay. Um, and so for today, our goal will be to just build up some intuition on the theory of perverse sheaves. So the focus won't, won't be on technical on technical details, but on building up a language. Um, so what I want to do is I want to focus just on the case of the flag variety so that we don't get uh, lost in the sort of um, in the complexities of the geometry of the affine Grassmannian and can just think about the categorical structure of the category of perverse sheaves. And what I, what I hope at the end of today is that you, you guys can make sense of this of a sentence of the form simple objects in the category of B equivariant perverse sheaves on the flag variety are indexed by elements of the divide group and sort of point at those simple objects. So that's the goal for today. Can I move, move on because I'm about to make a big jump? <laughs> okay, um, I'll assume so. If, I mean, if, if there's anything you need to fill up, the notes on the Slack um, are pretty close to, to what's here. So you should be able to find what's missing there. So, one remark I, I want to make is, so geometric satake on the geometric side says you got to look at equivariant sheaves on the affine Grassmannian. What we're going to be doing here mostly is we're going to be looking at constructible sheaves with respect to a given stratification indicated or given to us by the Bruhat decomposition. Um, so the, the idea is um, this is okay at least at the level of the affine Grassmannian, and it's mostly okay at the level of the flag variety. And I'm going to explain what I mean. So as far as filling, filling, up the, filling the gaps here go, one can equivalently look at sort of Bruhat construct, Bruhat const perverse sheaves. Um, yeah, um, so constructible with respect to the Bruhat decomposition. And this is motivated by the following um, idea, which is that if I have an equivariant sheaf, say on the flag variety, um, under the, the left action by B, um, the equivariance data is going to give me um, isomorphisms between various stalks on a given orbit. Since the orbits of um, the B action on the flag variety correspond to the Bruhat strata, uh, this will tell me that on each stratum I restrict to a local system. Um, and that's precisely what it means to be constructible um, with respect to a fixed stratification, something which we'll define in a moment. So this forgetful functor is well defined. Furthermore, one can check that it's also fully faithful. 
And so we can think of equivariant, B equivariant sheaves as a subcategory of um, S constructible sheaves. Now, in the case of the flag variety, at least as far as I know, uh, it may not be an equivalence. This is something I'm just not sure about, so I'd appreciate if anybody has a definitive answer. What I do know is that in the Satake category, um, this forgetful functor is actually an equivalence of categories. This is something you can look up in the um, expository notes on the geometric Satake equivalence by Bowman Rich, it's corollary 4.8. And one of the key, or the main ingredient here is that this uses semi-simplicity of the category, well, the Satake category. In order to prove that this functor, forgetful functor, is, is um, essentially surjective. Semi simplicity, as far as I know, is not something we have when looking at perverse sheaves on the flag variety. So I'm not sure you get the whole thing, but you definitely get a full subcategory. And the reason we move to the realm of constructible sheaves is that they're simpler to define and talk about. Um, equivariant sheaves are sort of quite cluttered. Um, while constructible sheaves are quite clean to define, so we'll just be working there for today. Um, that's just an opinion, of course, and if some other people love equivariant sheaves, they should feel free to translate um, as much as possible into that language. Um, so again, I'm about to change sections, so if people are still writing, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next page. Okay. Cool. So now we move on to actually talking about um, constructible sheaves. And again, um, this is gonna be an overview. Um, I'm probably gonna make some, I guess, misleading remarks on, this, on, on what the right categories we are looking at or how they come about. And that's, that's totally, that'll, that'll totally be my bad, but the, the focus is on intuition here and how, where things fit with respect to one another. Um, so to start with, I guess the good news is that this Bruja decomposition we got for the flag variety earlier um, are, is gonna form, is gonna give us a structure, the structure of a stratification on the flag variety, which we call the Bruja stratification. So if I start with a variety X, what I mean by a stratification is that I have a decomposition of X into um, this joint smooth connected locally closed sub varieties indexed by an indexing set S with um, an, additional, an additional property that has to do with this sort of closure containment, which says that if I take any two elements, S and T in my indexing set, either X sub S interse doesn't intersect at all with the closure of X sub T or I have a containment relation where one stratum is contained en entirely into the other. Um, one remark that I made earlier is that while the strata themselves um, are required to be smooth, we don't ask this to, to hold for X sub S sort of closure. Um, so that's just the definition of a stratification. So it's a, decomp a nice decomposition of a variety. Um, before we move on to construct constructible sheaves, I'll just make a comment is all the sheaves we'll be looking at check values in finite dimensional K vector spaces where K is the field that we fixed at the beginning, algebraically close of character C0, but this is also where you have the most leeway in being arithmetically fancy. If you desire, you can check positive characteristic and check rings with a few adjectives on it and that will still work. Um, but for us, we just take the simplest case and focus on the geometry. Um, so let's, pretty much once and for all, fix the Bruhat stratification of B. We'll write S to sort of distinguish it from the indexic set, but really the elements are just elements of W, the while group, and the order containment relations here are dictated to us by the Bruhat order from earlier. Um, and so now we define what a constructible sheaf is. Um, so if I have a sheaf of k vector spaces on B, I'm going to say it's constructible with respect to the Bruhat stratification if whenever I restrict the sheaf to a given stratum, what I obtain is a local system of k vector spaces. So remember that a local system is just a locally constant. 
sheaf. Um, I guess a locally free sheaf. on the sub w so that for every point I have an open containing it on which I just look like k to the r for some r. Um, is that, did I, did, I, did I miss something here or is that, is that right? Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Um, does locally free mean you actually um, in each of those neighborhoods have an isomorphism to the trivial like rank and sheaf or does it mean there exists an isomorphism? To I'm it? not quite sure. I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm confused because this, yeah, this, my, my bad, I should have been more careful, but this just feels like the I, I don't think you usually carry around that data. I think you just need there to exists such an isomorphism to the free sheaf of whatever rank yeah. um, it is. Yeah, it's, it's sort of like on a smooth manifold, you you like don't carry around the data of those charts, right? They're, you just exist. Though. You do have to carry around the transition functions, though. No. Uh, like if we're talking about a flat vector bundle. So I guess one way to kind of give a definitive definition without <laughs> really giving the definition is saying that one way to think about these things is that as a category, local systems on a stratum correspond to representations of the fundamental group of the stratum, where we think of it as a complex variety. Um, in particular, if my stratum is simply connected, which is all we'll be doing today, um, we only get um, <clears throat> trivial, just constant sheaves on it. Uh, constant free shifts on it. And the only in the composable one is going to be just the um, trivial line bundle on it. Um, <clears throat> and so the intuition behind constructible sheaves, where we actually just ask for the restriction of the sheaf on each stratum to be uh, a, lo a local system, is we're enlarging the category of local systems by allowing singularities to happen sort of around the closure of the strata. Um, so that's the main, I guess, motivation for looking at for looking at constructible sheaves instead of just local systems. Sorry, um, for do we not mean locally constant instead of locally free? Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's probably right. Yeah, um, I, I, I felt like something was off here. Thanks. Yeah, my bad. Um, and for the purposes of today, um, just looking at constructible sheaves won't be enough. We actually need to move to the derived category of um, complexes of sheaves whose cohomology sheaves are constructible, um, always with the fixed Bruhat stratification. Um, so the idea is we start with this category on the bottom left, just constructible sheaves. We're going to enlarge or sort of embed it as just complexes con concentrated in degree zeros inside the category D upper B lower S flag variety, so S constructible complexes of sheaves. And then we'll define a so-called perverse T structure, which will allow us to move back down to an abelian category, which is called the abelian heart of the category of uh, the derived category of constructible sheaves under the perverse T structures. And that's going to be the category of perverse sheaves on B with respect to the Bruhat stratification. Um, so we got to sort of go up to go back down, but we do end up with an abelian category. And it's kind of important whenever working with perverse shifts to remember that they sit inside a derived category. In particular, objects of it have to be thought about um, as complexes of shifts, and there is quite a bit of technicalities having to do with um, sort of keeping track of shifts as um, as complexes and making sure that the various derived factors one might want to apply to the to the category of perverse sheaves go where they should and otherwise whether or not we can rectify that um, using the um, what will what will define as the sort of projection factor 
um, with the product T structure. Um, but again, today's the goal is to build up all of that language, at least into, at the intu intuitive level. Um, and so we we'll start by motivating the definition of a T structure for those th who haven't seen it before. Um, is, is it okay if I move past this, this section here? Yeah, good. So, so we, we start by fixing a triangulated category C. Um, you can think of this as pretty much, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty safe to think of it as the derived category associated with an abelian category A, meaning that you take um, co-chain complexes in A, um, allow morphisms, identify morphisms of, of two chain homotopy and then formally invert quasi-isomorphisms. Um, and the idea, the, the, the main piece of structure that one gets when one starts with a triangulated category is so-called distinguished triangles. So even though C may no longer be a billion, we have this sort of replacement, which is which are called distinguished triangles that, that are of the form X goes to Y goes to Z. And then I have a translation functor that you can think of as moving a complex one step to the left. And I have a connecting morphism from Z to the translation by one. Um, so those are the main pieces of structure. And if, you, if you've worked with um, chain complexes of R modules before, you can think of this as um, the sort of mapping cone of a morphism. So the cone of phi, I don't know how best to write it, I guess I'll write M phi, but that's just a mapping cone. And that naturally has a map into the shift by one. Could be minus one, but it's, it's one or the other. But these are sort of the model structures and it, the, the, the standard structure, the distinguished triangles. And topologically, this is, something where you take a space and you put the mapping cone on it and then you just include, um, you include it, you include A into it. Um, yeah. Um, and so if we have, if we just, just think about um, the derived category of just R modules for now, I'm gonna, exp I'm gonna introduce a structure that sort of one could think about naturally, but, but which is, turns out to be a, like a, an interesting thing to, on which to isolate the key properties and try to find variants on it. And that's called the standard T structure on the derived category of R modules. So what I can do is I can um, use the grading to decompose, to, um, to extract two full sub subcategories of C um, in terms of where my cohomology groups are gonna live. So I can declare C, um, I don't know what the best way to talk about this, non-negative C. <laughs> C less than or equal to zero sounds like too many words. Um, I'll just talk about non-positive non C as those complexes in, of our modules where I have no cohomology in positive degree. And dually, I can look at those complexes of our modules with no cohomology in negative degree. So these are um, strictly full subcategory, subcategories of C. Um, and if I look at um, the inclusion functors of each of them into C, I can always find adjoints. So one of them is gonna be right adjoint, one of them is gonna be left adjoint, but we won't sort of spend too much time on that for now. But we'll, we will use those functors called the truncation functors and think of them as just kind of remembering the non-negative or non-positive part of a given complex and doing the right thing in degree zero to preserve cohomology groups. Um, and in particular, what I can do is I can, I can take a complex, apply one truncation functor and then apply the other. And this composite um, turns out to be independent of the order in which I compose them. We'll be denoting the composite H upper zero. It would be a functor going from C to the intersection of these two full subcategories, which we call the heart of C with respect to the standard T structure.
And so if you look at it, actually this is gonna be complexes with only zero cohomology and you can identify it with the, actual, the underlying category R mod. So in particular, this is an abelian category. Um, the way this map goes is it takes a complex and it just sends it to its zero cohomology. And so this kind of gives us a slogan, which is, um, in general, uh, I don't know where I wrote this, my bad. Um, yeah, in general, you can think of a T structure as a way of taking cohomology in C, possibly in ways that are different from the original standard T structure. The reason I'm saying this is, as we said, if you take the truncation functors and compose them, you get H0. You can also um, pre-compose with shifts and that will produce the functors hn for every integer n. And you can think of variants of the standard T structures as other the compositions of your category, which allow you to obtain cohomology groups, in a sense, in the abelian heart with respect to that T structure. Um, okay, let me try not to move on too much. Okay. And so as for the general definition of a T structure, I won't write it down here, but really, if you just keep in mind the standard T structure, all of the components of the def definition make sense. So I'll just write, for instance, one of them, which says if I have, say, an element in the non-positive complexes and an element in the non-negative complexes, where I, I mean, I use the terms non-negative and non-positive, but this could be any strictly full subcategory, I require that the two don't communicate once I shift one of them. So for instance, if I have a non-negative one, I can shift it to the left once. And so this time it's intuitively, it's strictly negative. And so it shouldn't be able to communicate as far as the home sets are concerned. Uh, so that's one of the axioms and others are similarly intuitive once you think of the standard T structure. But the key facts that, that tell us that it, it's worthwhile looking at T structures other than the standard T structures is whenever I have a T structure satisfying the given axioms, um, taking the heart will always produce an abelian category. And the truncation functor, that's the composite of going to non-negative part and going to the non-positive part, will always be um, what we call a cohomological functor. meaning that whenever I have a distinguished triangle um, as written here in C, if I apply this new TH0 with respect to an arbitrary T structure, what I get is a long exact sequence in the abelian category um, C heart, meaning, um, so this depends on T and in C heart, if I apply this, I'm gonna get TH0 of X plus TH0 of Y. And then I can also have a connecting homomorphism into, well, T H zero of X shifted by one, but this is the same by the sort of notation above as T H one of X goes to T H one of Y and so on. So this, this is more formal to sort of matter in the, in the direction of T structures give you a way of taking cohomology. Um, and so what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our derived category of constructible sheaves with respect to the Bruja decomposition and that's a valid triangulated category and we're gonna give a T structure on it and that's how we're gonna define perfect sheaves. So we define the category of S perverse sheaves or Bruja perverse sheaves on the flag variety to be the heart of this category of constructible sheaves, derived category of constructible sheaves with respect to S. Um, so yeah, this is this, oh, not enough lines. So it's an abelian category obtained by the above process, just truncate to the right and truncate to the left and get an abelian category. Um, the perverse T structure that we're gonna be using to define these truncation functors is given as follows. So 
there's usually a standard definition for perverse shifts that's um, quite intimidating and uses various alternatives on the notion of the dimension of the support of a sheaf. In the special case of the Bruhat decomposition, and I believe also in the special case of the Bruhat type decomposition for the affine Grassmannian, um, there is a sort of an easier or more intuitive definition, which I've written here. One caveat is this is only, this is only gonna work if um, the category of S constructible sheaves is closed under V under Verdier dual. So this is something I believe is true, but I can't quite guarantee yet. One sufficient fact, one sufficient condition for this to hold is for the Bruhat stratification to be what's called a Whitney stratification. So to satisfy certain niceness conditions. So if, if somebody is convinced or has a reference as to, the, as to this fact, then I can, I can sort of guarantee you that this is a valid definition for the perverse tree structures. Otherwise there might be a caveat. Um, in any case, um, the, the, the perspective I'd like to offer is um, we're gonna declare a sheaf F to be um, concentrated in non to, be, to be in the non-negative perverse part of the Dirac category of constructible sheaves, if and only if um, pulling back the sheaf to every stratum um, produces a, an element of the Dirac category of local systems on the stratum, which is concentrated in degrees less than or equal to negative the dimension of the stratum. The dimension of the stratum is something we've declared earlier to be equal to the length of the Y group element. And dually, we're gonna say that a sheaf um, F is concentrated in perverse um, non-negative degree if whenever I take the um, upper shriek functor to go back to the stratum of a given element W, I land in, again, derived category, the derived category of local systems where I'm concentrated in degree greater than or equal to the same um, dimension, the dimension of the stratum. So, I mean, geometrically, this property is, is somewhat reasonable. It says, at least if we just take the non-positive part, it says when I restrict to a given stratum, I'm, I'm essentially um, a local system and I'm concentrated in a certain, in a certain place. Um, and if you take the intersection of it, it, it tells you that the behavior uh, has to happen sort of in degree equal to the negative dimension of the stratum. Um, well, modulo sort of this upper shriek and upper star difference, but I thought that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hey, so, yeah. Um, I think this is the general definition for sure. I think this is probably the best definition of perfect yeah. structure in general. But yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, it ties nicely with our work because we've given dimensions already and it kind of relates to relates to local systems and so on. Um, um, yeah, so something I haven't said earlier, and I guess I don't, I'm not sure I've, I've written down, so I'm just gonna write it down now, is I should note that for any um, stratum embedding, I sub W from a stratum into W into B, um, all of the functors I sub W upper star, I sub W lower star, lower shriek, and upper shriek are defined on sort of just looking at um, constructible sheaves with respect to the Bruhat stratification. We don't exit this stratification and go to the larger category of arbitrary constructible sheaves with respect to some stratification if we apply any of those functors. So that's, that's good news. It allows us to just manipulate things around. Um, and stay within this S constructible world. Um, yeah. And so the next step is to actually tell you what the simple objects of this category are. So I know there's a lot of content here. So any questions or does anybody would anybody like to, to, for me to like freeze here for a couple for a couple seconds? Or? Okay, cool.
So now I'll, I'll introduce the simple objects in the category of S constructible sheaves on the flag variety. And these are called IC sheaves, which stands for intersection cohomology. I couldn't really tell you a good reason for that, but I'm sure somebody in the audience, if somebody in the audience wants to like say it in the chat or say it out loud, they're welcome to. I mean, I only know sort of tangentially why they're called this. So I think like sometime in maybe the 60s or 70s, uh, McPherson and Gorski developed something called uh, intersection cohomology, in which they, it was like a very geometric uh, sort of chain theory where they said, okay, like we're going to make this homology uh, based on some chain complex where we literally select like geometric chains and sort of impose conditions on them. Uh, and those conditions were conditions on uh, sort of like where, how would those chains could intersect the various strata of your stratified space. Um, and so you don't just have, I think like one intersection cohomology, you have a whole family of them depending on uh, how you select your perversity function, which tells you how your chains can intersect your strata. Um, and so if you form this sort of like very geometric theory and then take, you know, take the, uh, the cohomology of this chain complex the same way that we all sort of learned uh, homology and Hatcher, uh, you get, you know, you get what you get. And it turns out that you can get the same answer by doing some sort of derived thing where you sort of push, pull and do a bunch of kind of like functor stuff in the derived category and then I think like McPherson so and, and Deline was the one who came up with uh, I guess his definition of IC sheaves or that's what they're called IC sheaves and then if you take I think like the hyper cohomology of these IC sheaves what you get actually coincides with this like geometric chain definition that McPherson and Gorski came up with. And I think they just decided to call them IC sheaves for intersection cohomology because the hyper cohomology of these sheaves coincides with this geometric chain theory that they came up with in the 60s. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Maybe thanks. someone here to say an answer. Better. That's really good. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Kenny. Um, yeah. All right. So that's, yeah, that's the motivation. Uh, um, in our in our settings, the definition is very succinct. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the way in which they are, they first arose was was very geometric. Um, yeah, and so I guess what I just wrote up there as a comment is back as a fact: the fact that um, the the category of constructible shields with respect to the Bruhat stratification is closed under all four derived functors you could associate to a given locally closed embedding of a, strat of a stratum into the flag variety. And thanks to that, we can define the so-called IC sheaves as follows. So as we saw before, each stratum is just an affine space, so it's simply connected. Therefore, if I want to look at simple objects in the category of local systems on the stratum, all I get is the trivial line bundle valued in K, the coefficient field. Um, and I have two ways of moving k forward. I can look at i lower star k or i lower shriek k and get elements in the category of constructible sheaves on the flag variety. Um, what, or, or inside um, the category of perverse sheaves, which I should have noted earlier contains lo local systems. Um, and so what we're going to do is kind of a combination of those two pushes. We're going to take the IC sheaf associated to a given element of the Weil group W to be the image of the natural inclusion of the lower shriek functor into the lower star functor. So this is going to give us a, an S constructible sheaf and if needed, you can compose that with a projection by pH zero to make sure you land in perverse shifts on the flag variety. So for those who, for whom it might be the first time that I lower shriek appears, 
um, intuitively you can think of it as the direct image functor with the twist, the derived functor associated to the direct image functor with the added condition that we ask uh, for only sections with proper support. So this is the functor associated to this assignment at the level of sheaves that takes an open to those sections in the restriction of that open to the stratum whose support is a, is a proper subset of B sub W. Um, in particular, uh, the usual property is if you have a proper morphism, this coincides with I lower star. Uh, this might not always be the case, and in particular for these locally closed embeddings, this isn't something you can expect um, to always happen. But what you always do get is a natural inclusion into I lower star, because all sections contain um, sections with compact support, proper support. Yeah, uh, maybe so. Just maybe one thing that's important to point out is that I like this, like this image thing only makes sense for perverse sheaves. So like for this I shriek and I push forward, you're thinking about them as um, like literally these objects in the Abina category and looking at the image. They, mm -hmm. they do not make any sense I see. for yeah, general I chain complexes. So yeah, so like you don't have to put the pH zero, but yeah, it just it only makes sense for push forward of perverse sheaves. I guess a less ambiguous fact that turns out to be equivalent yeah, is yeah, you just you can just take the image of applying pH zero to yeah. yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And so you get a perverse sheaves on B that is S constructible. Another jump here, anybody needs um, to write anything down? Or should I or can I move on? Okay. So the the nice properties we get is each of these IC sheaves is actually a simple object um, as an element of the category of S constructible sheaves on the flag variety. And these are actually all of the simple objects in this, in this category up to isomorphism. So what we get is a one-to-one -one correspondence between simple objects in the category of S constructible sheaves in B and elements of the Vi group. Um, and this is, this whole story is going to be very similar to the, the um, affine Grassmannian story later on, where, as I said, in that case, S constructible sheaves and um, GO equivalent sheaves are the same thing. And so later on, we'll get via the Bruhat Chai uh, stratification of the affine Grassmannian that simple objects in the Satake category are indexed by the same indexing set as the Bruhat Chai decomposition, with, in that case, will be the dominant co-weights. But the, the structure of the argument is the same. Uh, so yep. maybe stop me if you're about to say this, but I feel like we should mention that in general, um, IC sheaves are labeled by a stratum and a local system. Yes, in general. Stratum, exactly, yeah, so in general, um, if you, you define IC of a stratum with respect to a so, uh, you, you define an IC sheet with respect to a locally closed subset of a space X and a local system on it. Um, in our case, in our case, BW is simply connected, so we don't we don't have any variation here. We we only have um, trivial sheets on it. And the construction is exactly the same as what Saad said. You just take the image of the tree push forward and the star push forward. If you put L where he wrote K up, like upstairs, you'd get the same thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, I wasn't gonna mention that, so thanks. And so once we have these simple objects identified in S constructible sheaves, we can ask whether our category is semi-simple, i.e. whether we can reach all other objects using um, just direct sums of these objects. And so the question boils down to are there non-trivial extensions of simples in our category? Um, and the answer can be checked in terms of certain home sets with, for which the, the intuition comes again from looking at the direct category of R modules in which um, you, can, you may remember from just an algebra course that, let's see where I can write that, um, maybe here extensions of two R modules M and N are going to be classified by x to one, r of m and n, 
And if we, we, we can interpret that in the derived category as the R hon of M comma N shifted by one, meaning as the degree one maps between the, the two objects viewed as chain complexes in the derived category. And, there, and it turns out that if I have any um, triangulated category with a given cheese structure, the same story works out. Meaning that if I check x1, x1 of two objects in the abelian heart, um, it's equivalent to computing the derived ho the hom in the derived category between x and y shifted by one. Um, applying this to the context of perverse sheaves, what we get is that semi simplicity of um, I guess p lower s b is equivalent to the vanishing of the home in the derived category of constructible sheaves between two given IC sheaves uh, indexed by two elements of the Vi group with, uh, with one of them shifted by one. So that's the condition we'll be using um, later on, or I guess Alberto will be using to prove that on the category of server sheaves on the affine Grassmannian with respect to the Bruja type certification is semi-simple. Um, so again, I don't think that's true um, over the flag variety, but I'm not sure of that fact. I just know that this is a valid criterion. Yeah, yeah, those are definitely not true. Um, there's a lot of ways to see it, but mm -hmm. they are, very non-trivial extensions between yeah, yeah. the IC shifts and they're interesting to think about in all right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So it, this is not true in in the flag variety case, but it is true in the F and Grass menu case. Yeah, perfect. Um, and so I guess what's written here is mostly things I've said, um, the classification of simple objects. As I sheaves in the Satake category corresponds to dominant weights, co-weights. Did I write weights or co-weights? Sorry, um, I wrote code, it's good. And um, the category turns out to be sim semi-simple using that criteria. And so you only need to think about IC shifts to, to obtain all of the objects of the Satake category. All right, so I guess all that remains is to talk about the convolution product. Any questions or comments about this part of the talk? Okay, so the last structure will be given to the category of perverse sheaves on B on the flag varieties is gonna be a convolution product. In this case, now we're gonna move back to the equivariant settings. And as motivation and to sort of convince you that most of the construction isn't that intimidating, I wanna um, start just by thinking about functions on a finite group G um, and just remind ourselves what one learns is the convolution of two such functions. So we usually define the convolution of F and G to be this sum um, of all over all Y of F of X times Y inverse uh, in G times G of Y. And then we, we divide by one over the order of G so that um, the constant function one is the multiplicative unit in the resulting ring. Um, and I'd like us to just rewrite this formula in a way, okay, let's see. Where, yeah. I'd like us to rewrite this formula in a way that's more functorial and that can be translated to the language of sheaves. Um, sort of following the general intuition that sheaves are categorified analogs of functions. Um, so if I take this formula, I can rewrite it as one over the order of G times, well, I can notice that I'm taking precisely all elements Y and Z, which actually multiply to X. So I can check this to be the set of all elements um, Y and Z such that the product is X and then F of Y, G of Z. And this is the same as one over G, where I integrate over the fiber of M in over X. Um, so I integrate over all pairs Y and Z that live in the fiber of M over X. And then what I'm checking is I'm checking this product 
f times g as an element of uh, functions on g times g. And I'm applying it to the pair y comma z. In functorial language, what this is, modulo scaling by one over the size of g, this is the push forward under m of um, the function given by pulling back f under the projection from g mod g to the first factor, and then tensor product, the second projection push pull back of g applied to the point x. Um, where here um, tensor product is just pointwise multiplication in this case. So that gives us a formulation of convolution that's more sort of conducible to uh, a shift theoretic generalization. So we'll try to imitate that at the level of shifts, but we also have an equivariance to carry around. And that's, that's one, I guess, aspect of the construction that I haven't covered um, at the level of functions. Um, but what we can already see at the level of functions is unfortunately, if I look at functions on G mod H, this is actually not closed under convolution. So this operation doesn't restrict to the subspace given by um, functions invariant under right multiplication by H. On the other hand, what I can do is look at double cosets of G with action on the, on the right and on the left by H. And that's the same thing as looking at B equivariant sheaves on G mod B. That's kind of what we're doing is we're looking also at double cosets of G. And in this case, I think my application is kind of frozen. So let's see. Mm. Okay, we're back. So in the case where I look at, at double cosets, I do get a well-defined operation going from uh, by invariant functions on G to two by invariant functions on G. Um, okay. So everything we'll do here is gonna be is gonna take place at the level of um, equivariant constructible sheaves, and then one can show that the operation restricts well to equivariant perverse sheaves. That's not something I'll be going over, but the idea is that our functor, the convolution factor is gonna be t exact with respect to the perverse t structures, and so it restricts well. Um, so on to the construction. Any any question? So let's start with two B equivariant sheaves on the flag variety. The first step is to form the exterior product as an element of, uh, as a sheaf on, on, on the flag variety times itself in a way that sort of mimics what we did earlier. I can take the sheaf pullback of F, take the derived tensor product with the sheaf pullback of G. And that gives me a valid element of uh, a, valid sheet, a valid B times B equivariant sheaf over, over the flag variety. And now, if I were in the non-equivariant set, set, setting, I would just say, okay, push by M. But we need to ensure that what we get at the end of the day is a B equivariant sheaf on the flag variety. And in order to do that, we need to actually pass through this diagram that I've drawn here and manipulate the sheaf a little bit. So what, what, what we have here in this diagram is so the space upstairs, G times the flag variety, is also gonna be interpreted as a B times, as a space equipped with a B times B action, given by saying B1 and B2 acts on a pair G comma YB as B1 X, B2 inverse, and then B2 YB. So that's a, uh, so that, that's gonna be, turn out to be a principal B bundle with respect to the second component. Um, and as such, um, you, can project it, you can project it down onto what's called the induction product, I believe, induction space with respect to this action. And so this is, this is gonna be a, a, a space equipped with a B action given by B acts on X comma YB as X B inverse B Y B.
And so what we do now is we start. Um, so yeah. it's, it's not exactly that um, there's like that diagonal B action. It's like you quotient out with respect to that diagonal B action. Mm -hmm. So like there, those two points that you wrote, like they just be identified like X, Y, B and X, B inverse comma B inverse. Y, B, like those would just be identified. Right, it's, um, a of the it's a quotient with respect to the diagonal action, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Yeah, so, so what we can do now is we, we started with our sheaf here. So this, um, this box product. And we can just put it back under E, which is the, just a projection onto the first factor. That map is smooth and equivariant, so one so one can make sure that the pullback is actually going to be um, equivalent under the B times B action upstairs. And from there, what we have is that Q also induces a map by pullback. And this is a place where I won't be completely formal, but um, modulo, like being careful of shifts and sort of thinking about the right actions, one can use Q to obtain an equivalence of categories under pullback between um, the category of B equivalent sheaves on this, in, on this induction space and the category of B times B equivalent sheaves on the product with respect to the actions defined above. So, and once we have this equivalence of categories under pullback, we can say, well, just find the unique element um, of the domain, which is sent under pullback to this E upper star on the box product of F and G. And so this, get, this gets us here um, into a new element, which we denote by F box product upper tilde G. And then we can do the last step, which um, sort of finite group, theory, finite group theory tells us is just push forward this new sheaf. Um, and define the convolution product of these two sheaves F and G to be this push forward of the, I guess, equivariant box product of F and G. And this, this is a valid element of the equivalent sheaves on B. Um, in diagram form, you get this. Um, so you can just kind of go around the diagram, first take a pair, take their um, exterior product, pull back under P, um, use this equivalence of category, which needs to be phrased more carefully to get a unique pre-image and then push it. Um, and that's how you get to the convolution product. Any questions, comments? Okay. So, one can check that this is a valid monoidal stru structure on um, the category of equi B equivalent perverse sheaves on the flag variety. The unit um, under this operation is gonna be given by the IC sheave associated to the unit element in the value group. And um, one can also construct um, a similar convolution product on the Satake category by, I guess, a similar argument where you just replace B by G O and curly B by B of Grossmannian and then run essentially the same diagram and you get a valid convolution structure there. Um, some nice facts about this convolution structure is um, it behaves well with respect to IC sheaves. Um, you have that um, the, if you take a bunch of um, reduced, a bunch of simple reflections S, and check the convolution product of all of the associated IC sheaves, you get a semi-simple object in the category of B equivalent perverse sheaves. And um, furthermore, okay, if, if W could be expressed in reduced form as a product of all of these simple reflections, then um, the I see sheave associated to W appears in the direct sum decomposition of this convolution product with multiplicity one. Um, yeah, I don't know why it kind of 
30% of the page got uniformly erased, but erased, but I hope this is clear. Um, okay. Um, the next step is, and sort of the last thing I want to say today is how what we've been doing relates to the classical Sataka equivalence. So this is something I could have opened the talk with, but um, I guess I've chosen to like say it as, as, as like at the end. So if I take, hmm. let's see. Um, I don't know what, why this got erased, but anyway, if I just check this uh, category of B equivalent perverse sheaves with, together with a convolution product, I get a symmetric monoidal category. And so I guess I can check the growth any group of it. And I obtain a ring. Turns out that this ring is precisely the Hecke algebra, which one obtains by looking at the Coxeter group W with uh, a choice of simple reflections S. Um, and I guess remember that the choice of simple reflections S was involved in um, sort of the dimension of the strata of, of the flat of the Bruha decomposition. So it would make sense that it appears as a parameter. Um, but the even more interesting um, result that we get is at the level of the affine Grassmannian, if we take the analog um, construction of the convolution product, then uh, one gets a symmetric monoidal category um, with, the set, with, the set, with respect to the Satake category. And what I can do now is I can, I have to do one more thing, is, is the Satake category is an abelian subcategory of the category of constructible sheaves. Now I can enlarge it by actually allowing for shifts of the constituent complexes. Um, and it turns out that if I do that, I get a category. Oh, so, sorry, was there any question? Yeah. Um, so I have a question, so scroll up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so the Hegel category is something that's mm -hmm. over, say, sigma joint Q, which is a form of variable. So what is that action, conf like how does that action come from the left-hand side? So the, let's see. Um, so you're you're gonna want to do what Saad wrote just under that for the Satake thing, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just should be there too, but it's right under it where you're gonna really want to take like not perverse sheaves, but like shifts of perverse sheaves okay. inside constructible mm -hmm. sheaves. And then Q will just be like a shift operator. Ah, ah, and that's and that's different, right? If you take like if you just take a category and you take the derived category and take K zero of that. I guess it's yeah, it it'll, it'll be different, yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah, because then shift is just negation in that situation. Right, but but that is wouldn't they be the same then? I mean, you shouldn't get a different category. You shouldn't get a different cat category if you take case of the billion thing or case zero of the. If you take an arbitrary G structure, you're not guaranteed that um, the derived category generates is equal to the cate the derived category started with. Ah, that's a good point. And and I mean, I I'm, I'm assuming this this happened. Yeah. What? What? Uh, I think you just cut. Oh, sorry. No, I, I, I guess I should assume that this is happening here because I don't think in the abelian category, we just take a proper shift. You don't have this. Yeah, I think Alberto was right. You need to add, allow for shifts. That's for sure. Um, yeah. That's okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And so, yeah, that's something I was definitely going to incorporate in the affine Grassmannian case where you check this attack category and then you allow for shifts. Um, and then if you check the Grothendieck ring, what you get is the so-called spherical Hecke algebra associated to the Coxeter group W. Um, and here, it's written in yellow, the shifts upstairs are going to correspond to an action by Q plus or minus a half um, on the spherical Hecke algebra, hence a, a, a Z adjoint Q plus or minus a half algebra structure on that algebra. And now remember that, remember what the geometric set equivalence says, Oh wait, we have we have a guest. <laughs> Remember yeah, that so. geometric satake says that um, this category perverse shifts on the Fangrassman in convolution product is equivalent to representations of the Langlands dual group with tensor product representations. And on the right hand side, if I check the growth ending ring, where again I allow for shifts again. So I view it 
in sort of it's the right category and I allow for shifts, then what I recover on the right hand side is um, functions on the co-weight lattice of T um, that, that are invariant under the value group. Um, here, the action on the, of the value group on, on this ring is given by looking at the action of the value group on the co-weight lattice that we started this lecture with and just sort of extending it linearly. And the intuition here is that um, this is going to be the same thing as functions on kind of the co-weights of T that are dominant, I believe. Alberto, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yep, that, that's yeah. solid. And the idea being that, you know, one of the veil chambers contains the dominant weights and the others are related by an orbit. And so if we, if we take, and, and so the, what the geometric static equivalence specializes to, once I check the growth ending ring on both sides, is an isomorphism of um, Z adjoint Q plus or minus a half algebras between the spherical Hecke algebra and this algebra where I take Z adjoint Q plus or minus half and then I add the co-weight lattice of G and I check W invariance. And that's what's usually known as the classical Satake equivalence. Yep, and uh, that's all I had for today. So yeah, thanks for coming. And yeah, uh, just I'll open the floor for questions and I'll be here for the next five to 10 minutes and anybody's welcome to just continue chatting in the chat or just speaking. Surya so has a question. He's asking if you can, uh, <laughs> his mic isn't working. He, he's asking, could you possibly do an example calculation of convolving some IC sheaves on, on B? Um, I can try. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe a good exercise would be to check whether like the IC sheave associated to the unit element of the value group gives you um, something isomorphic to what you started with. So mm -hmm. maybe you can add a page or something. So let's say, let's say we start with I see. Well, let's, I guess, work with SL2 and take ICE and try to convolve it with IC associated to the unique simple reflection and see if we can get um, something isomorphic to IC with a simple reflection. Um, well, let's see. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's quite a few steps, but um, the first map here, let's see, the diagram at the level of groups is given by have P times P here. And then, well, the first one doesn't really, but this one. Okay, so this is just P1. And this is so true in our case. And then B is going to be elements of the form alpha, alpha, inverse, beta. Um, and so we got a first pull back each of these IC sheaves to the product and um, take their tensor product. So, what um, I mean, I'm this like. I'm totally like in favor of people just chipping in because that may take like 10 to 15 minutes to figure out on my own. So, um, so the first thing I'm looking at is so this this is viewed as an element in the draft category. Um, so I guess maybe we should look at. So, so the, this one is just to push forward um, basically under a point um, of the constant sheaf. So this is the this is gonna be the um, skyscraper sheaf at the point um, at like the chosen Borel. And then this guy um, is gonna live on A1 and it's just gonna be the constant sheaf on A1, I believe. 
Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I mean, it's gonna take me too long, I think. So maybe I can try to like type it up and, and send it just to the Slack or something. Yeah, uh, these, these computations somewhat exist in some of the references, but yeah. they're a bit hard to do like by hand. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it, it's kind of five steps and it takes place in kind of the right setting. So I don't wanna, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I'm probably gonna get confused if, if I just try to do it on the spot. But it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely a good exercise to, to work that out. So one small answer, which may or may not be satisfying, is that if you take G and B and everything to be over a finite field, then you can actually do the computations just using like the finite field notion of finite group notion of Hecke algebras, which is just functions on double cosets, and the notion of convolution, which Saad wrote at the very beginning. And it's kind of an interesting exercise to do with like SL2 and B. Mm -hmm. um, everything is finite. Um, and you'll get the same things, except with Q being like whatever the cardinality of the finite field you chose is. Yeah, and I guess in a, sim I guess in a similar way, you could pass under the geometric Satake equivalence to um, wrap of PGL2 and sort of see which representations that corresponds to take their tensor product and go back, assuming you can identify like an arbitrary representation with a nice, with a, with, with a perverse shift, that that could be one computation way. Saad, also just one more comment, just because Leon asked about it and seemed uh, to have some concerns. When we said that the Hecke algebra was like shifts of perverse sheaves, I think um, the real completely true statement is that um, it's you want to only take semi-simple objects. So objects which are direct sums of IC sheaves. Um, so in particular, the statement is sort of saying that the IC sheaves convolve the same way the generators multiply in the Hecke algebra. That makes it um, I guess, yeah. But yeah, you don't want to have like weird extensions because um, mm -hmm. if people have thought about the Hecke algebra at all, it has a basis labeled by elements of the vial group. So you wouldn't expect like all those. No, no, I, I, think, I think you want, uh, okay, I think, I think I got it figured out. So I think the way it works is that you, you, you don't want to just take the semi-simple objects. You want all objects because the Hecke algebra has two canonical bases. One of them is given by the standard basis, and one of them is given by the casuistic basis. And in this language, this corresponds to like the ones given by like this verma thing corresponding to the IC, like some extensions of them, and the other one is just a simple object itself. I think where the shift comes in is that like you can actually get another grading on this category of a filtration of sorts, and uh, that filtration would that 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 filtration give you the Q, and if you forget the grading, I think you just set Q to be. Uh, I, Leon, do you have Promote's book? Um, sorry, I don't think I do. Okay, well maybe we can. Well, yeah, I mean, you might you might be right, but um, I'm sure mean, looking at it now, and I I think you only want to take some well because. The Hecke algebra, no matter what, is only going to have a basis um, of elements of the same cardinal as the vial group, right? Like, no matter what. Yeah, basis. yeah no, definitely, yeah. So if but, you. But if you take extension, it doesn't change anything. Oh, like that's fair, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the I... point is that, yeah, so like, if you do this, if you take indecomposable and you only take some direction of some symbol, it doesn't change anything. And the multiplication is also given by the basis. So that also doesn't change anything. Yeah, I guess, yeah, the way I think he defines is that you take like the split um, K0 of only semi-simple objects. So yeah, it, it yeah. it could be um, the case that it doesn't matter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think the similar, yeah, it's the same thing as take the four bin category and, and, and take K0 after. Yeah. Yeah. But, but maybe my, I think I asked my own question, which is that the... Um, but I, I still feel like a little bit skeptical because I've seen it the other way in a couple of places, but I mean, you're probably right there. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think K0 shows like the, this incomposable thing shows up everywhere. And I think it's equivalent in this case. Maybe I'll just do that. 